13, it's about the unity and maturity in the body of Christ. It's found on page 1818 on the Pew Bible. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who ascended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Amen. Well, over the past several weeks, we have been examining the great covenants of the Bible. From the creation covenant in Eden to the covenants with Noah, Abraham, and Moses, which were all fulfilled in the new covenant of Jesus Christ. So why are we taking all this time to educate ourselves on the importance of covenant? You might be asking. Well, the reason is this. We as congregationalists are a people of the covenant. And so this morning I want to delve into how we became a people of the covenant through our unique history as Christ followers. And to do this, we must go way back to the mid-16th century in England and begin with Robert Brown, who was the first Englishman to proclaim congregational principles in writing. Brown was born in the middle of the 16th century in a family that was related to Queen Elizabeth's great statesman, Lord Burley. Upon entering Corpus Christi College in Cambridge in 1570, Brown was influenced by the teaching of one of the greatest early Puritans whose name was Thomas Cartwright. And Cartwright vigorously advanced the need for the reformation of the Church of England. In time, Brown began to preach in the parishes around Cambridge, which leaned toward a Puritan message. But he came to understand that reformation from within would not bring renewal within the church but only be like a new patch that was sewn on an old, worn-out garment. Complete separation from the Church of England was necessary for Brown, for two reasons. First, he maintained that withdrawal from the Church of England was primary, because the authorities approved the inclusion of unbelievers who were legally required to be members of the state church, but whose presence made true spiritual communion impossible. He was thinking about this unity that we just read about in Ephesians. Unless everyone is one in the spirit, you will not have unity in the, Bible, in, in the, in the body. And so he, he said he would break with the Puritans because he saw that their desire to purify from within was impossible. Because they were waiting on the same church authorities to take the initiative to undertake reform. But it was very clear that the church and state were inextricably entwined and purification would not come from a civil arrangement. So Brown, of course, went back to the Bible for the model of church organization and particularly to the form of covenant, uniting believers to God and to each other by willing consent, not by the compulsion of the state. And so united, a church recognized the duty of, to God the Father and to Christ as the lawgiver and the ruler of the church. Reflecting Paul's template that's outlined in Ephesians 4, Brown believed that church unity is only a work of the Holy Spirit, reflected through the one hope, Jesus, the one faith and one baptism, held together by the one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. 
Christ's graces and powers are for the use of every member. And so he enumerated some of the specialized ministries. Some are empowered as apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers and elders and deacons and widows. But every believer is, as Brown wrote, made a king, a priest, and a prophet under Christ to uphold and further the kingdom of Christ. So the church polity that Brown advanced was radical because it was democratic in nature. Church members choosing both their officers and their pastors who were first chosen by God through an inward calling of the divine in the heart. Church leaders were not to be masters and judges over the members, but examples of the love of Christ in action. Brown believed that local churches needed to be connected to one another and foresaw the necessity of calling meetings to se of several churches to settle any matters that required wider wisdom and discernment. And so as such, Brown laid the foundation for the Visnage Councils, which congregational churches have for centuries employed in matters of ordination and concerns for which a local church recognizes the need for broader experience and wisdom. We still do this today, especially when we're ordaining a new candidate for ministry. But also if the church is having issues and, and challenges that they cannot you know, solve within the body, they seek the wider um, input of the wider body. No church is an island. So Brown had this picture of a covenant relationship of church members with God under his sovereignty and that God extended that to the state. Democracy in one field extended to the other because Brown said that all governors should rule by the will of the governed, making the basis of the state essentially a compact, which of course is the basis of our government. Now in Massachusetts, it's really easy to see Brown's brilliant brushworks of church polity forming this state and the nation. He foresaw each Christian as a free person by virtue of an individual relationship with God in Christ. And so the church, as the complete and discrete body of Christ, in covenant relationship, called into being, filled and equipped by God, who as head of the church is the true lawgiver. Our laws do not come from the government, they come from God. And so all liberty was a gift of God, both in the church and extending to the state. And indeed, in Massachusetts, I don't know if you know the history of Massachusetts, the state itself emanated from the church. In Massachusetts, a church meeting had to be established before a town could be incorporated. You look at any of the towns around here, every single one of them had a church first. Marshfield, Duxbury, Pembroke, any of the churches around here had to have a congregational church to be a town. Well, we don't really hear much about Brown in our time, but you know, we owe much to his work and his faithful love for Christ and his church. Now, Brown was a pamphlet writer. In those days, people didn't write books so much, but they wrote pamphlets, and they were disseminated all over the place. And he did a lot of writing that fanned the flames for reform among theology students in Cambridge University. Cambridge became a hotbed for the Puritan uh, movement. And um, some of these students began to preach separatist views now from the pulpits in many of the Anglican churches notably in the east and in the north of England. Now Richard Clifton, who was born near Babworth in 1553, now Babworth is in Nottinghamshire, um, it's up in the north of England, and he was a Cambridge graduate, and he was one such preacher that began to preach separatist views. In 1586, he became vicar of his home church, All Saints, in Babworth, which is just a few miles from Scrooby, the home of William Brewster, who was also a past student at Cambridge University. Now Brewster was an urbane and well-connected man. He was schooled in Latin and Greek. He was assistant to William Davison, ambassador and secretary of state to Queen Elizabeth. So he spent a lot of time at the court in London of the Queen. He went to Netherlands first with Davison, so he knew what was going on in Holland. Eventually, Davison fell from favor, and so Brewster lost his posting in London. He returned to Scrooby, 
He took up his father's former post as postmaster in 1589, and he was housed in the manor house of Scrooby that was owned by the Archbishop of York. And so because he was there under the Archbishop of York's um, you know, favor, he was required to provide lodging and transport for traveling government servants. So he was a quasi-church government official, if you will. Um, I'm looking at wrestling here. This is wrestling's great, 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 great grandfather. <laughs> I think it's nine grades. Ten. Ten. Okay. Well, you're the tenth generation, but if you go back, I mean, you have a grandfather, and then you then you start with the great grandfathers in that generation. So it's probably eight or nine. Yeah. Well, Brewster, he is the leading citizen of Scrooby, and he was required by law to attend the parish church of that community where he'd been baptized. But his separatist beliefs compelled him to make the seven-mile journey to All Saints Church in Babworth to sit under the teaching of Reverend Richard Clifton. Now, William Bradford described Clifton as a grave and reverend preacher who, by his pains and diligence, had performed a lot of good and, underneath God, had been a way of conversion for many. So it was probably here that Brewster met the young William Bradford. Orphaned at seven, and then suffering from a prolonged illness, which made him too weak to work on the family farm, Bradford occupied himself in studying, notably the scriptures. At 12 years of age, he traveled from the nearby village of Osterfeld in Yorkshire to Babworth, drawn by the preaching of Clifton. But to do this, he met with disapproval from his extended family who were raising him. And so in response to this, Bradford wrote, were I likely to endanger my life or consume my estate by any ungodly courses, your counsels to me would be very seasonable. But you know that I have been diligent and provident in my calling, and not only desirous to augment what I have, but also to enjoy it in your company, to part from which can be as great a cross as can befall me. Nevertheless, to keep in good conscience and walk in such a way as God has prescribed in his word is a thing I must prefer above you all and above life itself. Wherefore, since it is for a good cause that I am likely to suffer the disasters which you lay before me, you have no cause to be either angry with me or sorry for me. Yea, I am not only willing to part with everything that is dear to me in this world for this cause, but I am also thankful that God has given me a heart so to do and will accept me so to suffer for him. The age of 14, William Bradford showed the resolve and spiritual maturity of one who would become a giant of American Christianity. His family, however, followed through on their threat to disown him if he continued his heresy. And so William Brewster adopted him into his own home as a brother in Christ. John Robinson was a graduate of Corpus Christi College of Cambridge University, and he was called to assist Reverend Clifton as under pastor at Babworth. Now, with the accession of King James, the benign tolerance for renegade pastors and churches that was enjoyed under Queen Elizabeth ended, and Clifton was stripped of his pastorate but his con congregation wanted to continue on, and they did so in two house churches, one at Gainsborough Old Hall, which was a dozen miles away, and that was led by John Smythe, who was the pastor, and the other at the Brewster home in Scrooby, under Richard Clifton as pastor, Robinson as the teacher, and William Brewster as the ruling elder. Now I think the location of the underground house church in the manor house owned by the Archbishop of York must have been one of the greatest ironies <laughs> of all time. <laughs> right under his nose, this was going on. So, this newly formed church was no longer under the ecclesiastical authority of the Church of England. So the Scrooby Congregation <coughs> in 1606 formed itself around a covenant, and Bradford recorded the covenant. They shook off this yoke of anti-Christian bondage, and as ye Lord's free people, joined themselves by a covenant of the Lord into a church estate, in ye fellowship of ye gospel, to walk in all his ways, made known, or to be made known unto them, according to their best endeavor, whatever it should cost them, 
the Lord assisting them. Interesting that the 14-year-old William Bradford said he would do whatever God called him to do, no matter what the cost. And here it is in the covenant. People of the Covenant was officially birthed in Scrooby. The, it was first the first covenant that, that I know of that was initiated by man with God and not as in biblical times God with man. Because the Scrooby congregation's faith and commitment to God was so strong that they had the courage to initiate a covenant claiming God's very great promises in his gospel to lead them and to make known to them where and how they should go and depend on him to assist them. Now plainly stated, they were free people by virtue of the freedom that Christ gives to all believers. As free people, they exercise their freedom freely to join together in this covenantal relationship with God and each other, to form a complete and discreet body of Christ. And as a free people, they lived out the gospel together as they walked in all Christ's ways, known and to be made known in the future, always depending on God, no matter what the cost. The Scrooby congregation was sold out to Christ. S-O-U-L-D, L-E-D, okay? <laughs> Completely committed to following their Savior come what may. And today, true congregational churches continue to live out the spirit of the Scrooby Covenant. Now, this church covenant became the precursor of all the other covenants. When it came time to follow their Lord to an unknown land and without their pastor, John Robinson, who had to stay behind for the folks that were not able to get on the Mayflower, Robinson anticipated the need for his church to create a civil government in the New World and he gave them some guidance in his farewell letter upon the departure on July, in July of 1620. And this is what he wrote. Whereas you are become a body politic, using amongst yourselves civil government, and are not furnished with any persons of special eminency above the rest to be chosen by you into government, let your wisdom and godliness appear not only in choosing such persons as do entirely love and will promote the common good, not being like the foolish multitude who more honor the gay coat than either the virtuous mind of the man or the glorious ordinance of the Lord. I think the gay coat was a reference to these ecclesiastical robes that they wore that were shot with gold thread. It's not about the outer man is the inner man. Now, after their treacherous transatlantic crossing on the Mayflower, they had been blown off course by 100 miles. And so they were not within the boundaries of the Virginia Company where they had their patent. See, in order to settle in the New World, you had to have permission from the government to do that, and they got this charter. But they were way up here in New England. They were in uncharted territory without any legal framework to form a community. So they brought forward the tenets of their Scrooby Covenant and some of the guidance in, in Pastor Robinson's letter and the Pilgrim leaders created the Mayflower Compact. And this was a revolutionary act of forming a new government, government without permission from the king. You know, if they didn't have, you know, how many miles of ocean between here? 5,000? Uh, the king would have come after them big time. <laughs> they were doing something revolutionary. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the compact, and I'm indebted to Reverend Paul Jaley for his succinct analysis of, the, of these main points. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but just the main points. It begins, in the name of God, amen. It's a prayer, right? We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign, Lord King James. They had the ordering of their authority and their allegiance in the right way. God first, then the people, then the king. Having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith and honor for our king and country, they recognize that we're dual citizens, first of heaven and then on earth, and we possess both religious and civil liberty because of that. Solemnly and mutually in the presence of God, 
and of one another, cognate and combine ourselves into a civil body politic. Government authority rested on a covenant or the consent of the people. To enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws. All citizens are equal before the law. Think about that. What's being advanced today in our culture? Equity, not equality. As shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony. Laws are made to facilitate good for the people. That is the sole purpose of laws. Unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. And laws require approval and obedience by all to secure good for all. Though the Pierce Patent in 1621 made the Pilgrims legal in the eyes of England, the Pilgrim laws that were subsequently published copied the Mayflower Compact as a preamble. So they continued to function under this covenant as time went on. So they're off the coast of what is now Provincetown. The corner of American government was born. And the ideas contained within the Mayflower Compact are significant, and they foreshadowed the declaration that was to come 156 years later. Now, President Calvin Coolidge described the Mayflower Compact as the first constitution in modern times. Yet he also said the compact was not the most wonderful thing about the Mayflower. The most wonderful of all was that those who drew it up had the power, the determination, and the strength of character to live up to it from that day on. On the 300th anniversary of its signing, Coolidge proclaimed, it is our duty and the duty of every true American to reassemble in spirit in the cabin of the Mayflower, rededicate ourselves to the Pilgrim's great work by re-signing and reaffirming the document that has made mankind of all the earth more glorious. We are privileged. I don't want you to miss this. I want you to see way beyond yourself. We are privileged above all peoples of the earth to live in a nation that was founded by free people who knew they were free. The first words of their covenant declared their freedom and where true freedom begins as the Lord's free people. Their freedom came from God the sovereign ruler and creator of the universe. And we, you and me, we're the legacy of those free people. Not only for the nation, but for the church in this nation. We have a sacred and solemn duty as God's free covenant people to preserve and tell God's story of these free covenant people who followed God, no matter what the cost. To plant a church that was the seed of a nation and a harvest of millions of souls. And it all started right here. As today's people of the covenant, we can take no credit for our faith, which comes first from God and then through his mighty servants, our forebears. Just as Robert Brown stood on the shoulders of Thomas Cartwright, and Richard Clifton stood on the shoulders of Robert Brown. And William Brewster, William Bradford, and John Robinson stood on the shoulders of Richard Clifton. So we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us in this place. Our mothers, our fathers, our ancestors of faith. In a moment, I'm going to close this with prayer. And I want you to think about those who were the great cloud of witnesses for you and for us. They may be pilgrim ancestors by blood. Many of us have pilgrim ancestors in this church. Many of us, it will be family ancestors who carried forth the faith. Grandparents, mothers and fathers, church family, people who carried forth the faith for you. And so in the prayer, there's going to be a moment for you to speak their names out loud in praise and thanksgiving of God's great gift of these giants of faith in our lives. So let us pray. 
God, our Heavenly Father, from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. You shine forth beauty, perfect beauty. You come and you will not be silent. The heavens proclaim your righteousness. You gather to yourself your covenant people. You promise that when we call upon you in the day of trouble, you will deliver us. You have fulfilled your covenant promises all the days of our lives. And throughout the 400 years, your faithful people have worshipped you in this place. You have shown us your salvation and your unfailing love to our ancestors of faith and in each of the lives of the faithful here today. Father, we thank you for those who came before us, upon whose shoulders we stand. Thomas Cartwright, Robert Brown, Richard Clifton, John Robinson, William Brewster, William Bradford, Richard Warren, Thomas Cook, Thomas Tupper, Benjamin Nye, William Nye, all those whose names are now spoken. Please speak your ancestor's name out loud. Walter Neal. Patience, Patience Brewster. John Alden. Hazel Fuller Lyman. John Alden. David Alden. What about your mothers and your fathers? Walter Crawford. Phyllis Neal. Jennifer Perry. Didn't anyone else have a spiritual ancestor? For we cannot take credit for our faith. It comes from God through those who have faith. Mary McNabb. Walter and Ruth Nye. Daniel Perry and Chastity Bruce Ford. Lord, as your free covenant people today, rooted and firmly established in your love, by the unity of your Holy Spirit. May we stand strong so that future generations will stand on our shoulders. May we boldly embark on the journey you have set for us, no matter the cost, to move into the future of your kingdom, looking outward, reaching outward, living outward, sharing the extravagant love you have given to us for the love of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Amen. We are a covenant-making people. We have covenanted with each other and with God as a church. And so in order to keep our covenant, we must be willing to turn over our bodies, our spirits, and our lives to God, including our substance. And so today, for the first time in a whole year, we're